States. The lecture is to be delivered by Professor Gopal Balachandran. On behalf of Institute of Law, Nirma University, I welcome you all to this session, which is part of the series of lectures to be delivered by various professors and other professionals in the flagship event of International Teaching Month, which is organized every year by the Institute. It is my pleasure to introduce Professor Gopal Balachandran. Professor Balachandran is currently acting as Assistant Professor of Clinical Law, Director Externship Program, Co-Director Indigent Criminal Justice Practicum, Penn State Law, United States of America. He directs the Externship Program as well as the Criminal Appellate Post Conviction Track of the Indigent, Indigent Criminal Justice Practicum. Professor Balachandran also maintains an active presence in the international legal education by teaching legal writing to LLM students. He has presented working papers on teaching English language learners how to better read cases at Global Legal Skills Conference and has taught legal writing at Nirma University as well. Prior to his employment at the law school, Professor Balachandran worked as a public defender in Massachusetts, New York and Maryland. My gratitude to you, Professor, for agreeing to be resource person at the International Teaching Month and I welcome you. Uh, before I hand over the mic to you, Professor, there are a few protocols which I would like to inform to our participants and uh, uh, all other attending the session. Uh, I request all the participants to keep their cameras on and mic on mute mode. Uh, Professor Balachandran will be speaking for 45 minutes and then the questions on the session will be taken towards the end for which we have reserved 10 to 15 minutes. You may send your questions on my personal chat box for, your, uh, for the sake of convenience. With this, I hand over the mic to Professor. It's over to you, Professor. Thank you so much for the kind welcome and thank you so much for inviting me to speak. I always had such fond memories of coming to Nirma and I do hope that at some point in time in the near future, we'll be able to come in person again and uh, rekindle friendships and to just spend some time also um, going to all the wonderful Gujarati restaurants um, that we that I enjoyed last time. So that was really great. Um, so let me go ahead and see if I can share my screen. Um, okay, can everyone see the PowerPoint? I'm gonna put this into... Yes, it is visible to us. Okay, great, okay. Okay, so I will, um, as... Um, as Professor Gupta had mentioned, I, um, I was a former public defender for a number of years. And it's kind of interesting though, in, the, in my role as a public defender, what happens in the United States is, is that if you are not able to afford a lawyer and the government wants to put you in prison or in jail, they have to appoint a lawyer for you. <clears throat> and so in my role, I oftentimes interacted with police. I, I conducted a number of trials um, I was familiar with a lot of the laws and the sentencing that dealt with, um, with, uh, with the criminal justice system. Um, what made me interested in this topic, however, was actually a different, completely different set of experiences than my formal professional ones. Um, the reason for why I became interested in this topic is, is that, <clears throat> oh, let me see, okay, so that's me. Um, on the left-hand side, that's a friend of mine named Divine in the middle, and another friend of mine named Rich. And we ran for local government, okay, in state college. So this was like the local kind of town council kind of government, the legislative body for the town um, that we were, um, that we all, that we live in, and which Penn State is located in. And in the point of it, I mean, we all actually won our election. And so now we're actually local the local government officials in State College, all three of us. And what happened though is, is that as we were running for office, I always got two questions from voters. And those, those questions were, those questions were, are you for abolishing the police? <clears throat> are you for defunding the police? And so, now, on one hand, we would have to explain that we were not for getting rid of the police and not for defunding the police or like, you know, to giving away tools to be able to fight crime. And people were very concerned about that because partly my own background as a public defender and my own role in criminal justice work 
could have led people to have assumed that, um, that I wanted to get rid of the police or that all of us collectively wanted to get rid of the police or to take away their funding to defund the police. And that's, these were popular slogans in the United States. And they were also very controversial slogans. And um, you may have heard about this in, in, in India, but some of these protests that did occur were very uh, powerful, but also could be very controversial. So this is the thing that everyone asked me. And so as far as I was concerned, the thing that I was kind of wondering about is, is that I'd always been a, a proponent of reforming police. And in my professional work and in the amicus briefs that we file in courts um, in Pennsylvania and in my advocacy work um, as a public defender, this had always been on the back, back burner about reforming the police. But what I didn't really understand was what were these arguments? Why was it that people were asking for abolishing the police completely or you know, defunding the police completely? And what, where, where were these arguments coming from? And this was a lot of times, this was coming from African-American activists um, in the United States. So <clears throat> the goals of my talk are to provide perspective on the, on the uh, the defund abolish police movement through a historical lens. And so what I would like to do is to, you know, my, my conversation is gonna be, much of it is gonna be historical, partially legal, but much of it's gonna be historical. And the other part about this is the implications of this history for today. <clears throat> and to sort of consider what some of these uh, continuities are in policing as they occur right now in the United States. And of course, I wanted to provide a caveat, which is that this is not a comprehensive history. And I myself am personally not trained as a historian. I am a you know, attorney, a criminal defense attorney. I did a lot of trial work and appellate work, but I'm not a historian. And so <clears throat> I've not gone into the archives. I haven't looked at primary sources. And this is really much more of a, a kind of a secondary source type um, talk. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of that. Okay. Oops. <clears throat> Okay, so I think what might be kind of helpful is at least a little bit of background on uh, US history. Um, so, you know, during the reign of Akbar, um, the Mughal Emperor um, Akbar, there were actually no British colonies in the United States. Um, Akbar's reign um, ended in 1605 and there were no uh, British colonies um, in the United States at all. The first colony in the United States, the colonies was uh, Jamestown in 1607. And 1607 is kind of like the, the date. I mean, there are some older settlements in the Americas, but as far as for British North America, 1607 is the starting off point for the colonies in uh, Jamestown. And Jamestown is located in Virginia. And, um, and in, so that's like in the South of the United States, if I was gonna, Go ahead and um, if you're able to see my cursor, it's Virginia somewhere down here. And so that is one of the first colonies. Um, the second colony was actually up here in Massachusetts called the Plymouth Colony. And that was in 1620. And um, when these colonies uh, came up and sort of interesting to note also, you may have heard of this, uh, but there's something in the United States in the, through the New York Times called the 1619 Project. And why they call it 1619 is, is that the first enslaved people were brought to the United States in the Jamestown colony in the year 1619, okay? So we have Jamestown in 1607, Plymouth in 1620. And you have a lot of other settlements that are, that are, that are ongoing right now. New York City is founded in 1624. Boston is founded in 1630. Um, I think the one thing though to keep in mind is, is that at, at this point in time, um, even in the 16 and through the 1700s, the United States or the, the colonies of, uh, of, of Great Britain were really predominantly rural areas. This wasn't like a highly urbanized kind of area. It's not like the, you know, at that moment contemporaneously the Mughal Empire, the way say Agra or Delhi the way in which you had lots of people and lots of kind of urban infrastructure. The United States at this time, um, during, during, during this period, 
is still largely rural. And because of that, and because of you have such small settlements, and this will just give you one example, um, even at the time of independence in 1776, Boston only had about 15,000 people. And by the time that you're talking about 1700, there were still only about five or 6,000 people in Boston. And this is kind of considered a very urban area in the United States. So this is, these are still very, very small areas. And so as a result, what we think of as policing did not really occur or did not really exist in these places in the um, United States. There were very, there were almost, there were no police departments really in the North or the South. And for those of you who might not be familiar, this was sort of like always the big dividing line. And some of the same historical um, partisanship and some of the debates that we still have today are in some ways still defined by this initial line in the United States between North and South. The North was a more kind of industrial or what I thought of as more industrial area. And the South is more rural, more farming, more plantation farming. And it also contained enslaved populations, a lot of enslaved populations that were brought in from Africa. So um, at this period in time, you know, very sort of little formal policing. But you know, what they did have is they had something called um, the night watch. And basically in these small communities, um, I mean, it's, it's sort of almost like it's proto-policing. And there would be these groups of people who would go around and um, they would kind of like keep a, keep a watch out and they would sort of make sure that there was, you know, people were respecting curfew, they weren't out and about, you know, they would sort of question strangers. And right now, you know, the colonial experience, you have a lot of different types of enemies, right? I mean, you have Native American tribes that are outside of these settlements, the night watch is kind of looking after or looking out for. There's also might be foreign, uh, there might be Spanish and French um, colonial forces that are there. Um, at this moment in time, the French controlled Quebec, which is just the north over here in um, north of the United States. The Spanish control a lot of this area. They even controlled Florida for a long time. And so when you have like these types of um, uh, situation, this night watch is sort of important. And they work together with these colonial militias. And by militia, M-I-L-I-T-I-A, um, what that is, is is sort of like these irregular kind of um, uh, military, quasi-military, quasi-police force that were around that were meant to defend the settlements from these kind of foreign, as well as to sort of police what's going on internally. And I use police very, very loosely. And so what happens though, if there is a crime that occurs in a particular settlement, what happens is you have something called posse comitatus. Um, you know, lawyers in the United States, especially, we love our Latin words, right? We love to be able to throw in some Latin every now and then. And that is what posse comitatus is, right? Posse comitatus basically means that someone raising a hue and cry, if there is some kind of uh, burglary or some kind of offense that's going on, um, it's, it's sort of like, you know, um, the way it worked um, in, at least my uncle tells me in Kolkata, which is where part of my family's from, is that if there's someone in the neighborhood that is committing something, there's like a gang of people that will then show up there and they will beat up the person, the miscreant, whoever is committing this kind of offense. And that's kind of what the way it worked in, uh, in the colonial part of the United States, which is that um, there's something that occurs, like some kind of crime that occurs, and then there is this uh, set of people that will come in there and try and police and make sure that um, that person is caught. And that's the term for that is, uh, is uh, posse comitatus. So, um, of course, these night watchers, they were, you know, they had a very sort of not so great reputation. And um, this is actually a painting by Rembrandt called The Night Watch. And it sounds like it's a very heroic kind of endeavor. People are going out and they're, they're watching. Um, for whatever is occurring right now. And, um, but what, um, the way that the, that the contemporaneous people described um, the night watch say in New York City was that it's a parcel of idle drinking, vigilant snorers 
who never quelled any nocturnal tumult in their lives, but would perhaps be as to join a burglary as any thief in Christendom. Of course, it's old English, but hopefully you can kind of understand these were not nice things that, <laughs> that, that they were saying about the Night Watch. Um, they were kind of viewed as very unreliable. Um, they were kind of, they, they had to stay up all night and oftentimes they would engage in drinking. And they seemed really little better than the people who they were supposed to be policing and looking after. So, so, so with these kind of informal kind of uh, beginnings, you know, you, you, there's, as the United States becomes, you know, the demographics start changing, um, this is at least the standard story, is, is that um, there are some scholars that point to like four different, four different attributes that would, that would allow, um, that kind of give rise to why we need organized policing. And so one of them is an actual or perceived increase in crime. This is very important. Um, and I think the perceived increase is definitely uh, something to keep in mind, um, especially in the United States in the 20th century. The perception of crime has oftentimes um, far outstripped what actually occurs, um, but it's the perception, not just the actual, but the perception of an increase in crime. You have public riots, and we'll talk a little bit about that. You have public intoxication, alcohol. Alcohol. The United States has always had this... Um, this uh, kind of, you know, not, there's not just been a relationship towards slavery and a conflicted relationship at its founding. There's, all, there's oftentimes also been a kind of very conflicted relationship with alcohol and with drugs, as we see later on in the 20th and 21st centuries. Um, but public intoxication, this was considered another driving force for formal policing and a need to control the quote unquote dangerous classes, right? And of course, um, as we will see, a lot of this is immigrant groups at times. It's also enslaved populations in the South. But, um, and this is from a scholar named Richard Lundman, um, police and policing in the um, uh, scholar sociologist um, in the United States. Okay, so, so the way in which the standard story of policing kind of works is, is that, um, that you really have, um, it kind of begins with England, right? And it's a really a story of urbanization. And so, um, so what we need to do, um, what we need to do is, is that, and I saw a question about the Ku Klux Klan, and we will definitely get into the Ku Klux Klan later on in the talk, but, um, but the, the first kind of impetus, at least in the United States and the urban story at least is, is that policing equals cities. So you have Robert Peel, 1828, forming the first uh, Metropolitan Police Department in London. And that is an engraving of Robert Peel to the left over here. Um, and then there's kind of a, a piece of artwork that is meant to sort of depict how the police department kind of functioned. And that's kind of what they did. I mean, you know, they, they carried those sticks. They had some uniforms. There were 1,000 men hired. And it was kind of interesting. One of the principles that he had was that the degree of cooperation um, between the public um, that can be secured diminish, diminishes the need for force. Um, so, you know, it's a really kind of a community, um, community and, and public kind of relationship. But Keep in mind, policing is still looks, it's still very different than what we think of as uh, modern policing right now. And we really see this in the example of Boston. Now, I had mentioned that Boston, Boston is, um, is, uh, was formed in 1630. The first formal police department though in Boston wasn't until 1838. So just think about that for a moment, that for the first 200 years of its history, Boston had no police department at all. And that is, I think a part of what that shows is, is that there was informal policing that occurred as a result of it being a much smaller community. And, but it also kind of shows um, much more broadly that policing in the United States really um, for, a, for a rural, for a predominantly rural area wasn't really necessary in the same kind of way. And what policing grew out of, um, in part, 
was public health considerations. Um, Boston, um, like a lot of cities, was not very clean. There was all kinds of, uh, there, were, there were illnesses, there were waterborne illnesses, there was airborne illnesses, and people, people literally got sick and died. And so as a result of that, the Boston um, authorities, they started to have different types of health and sanitation authorities. And the police initially, when they were formed in 1838, the goal was to sort of help to sort of enforce some of these public health laws. And they would go around and sort of make sure trash was picked up, uh, things like that. Um, and, um, and of course, there was also one other thing that really kind of brought um, the police department to the fore. And that was um, in part because of uh, New England's Puritan, um, the first Plymouth colony was by a Christian sect called Puritans who were very, very religious and, um, and New England um, overall, even to this day kind of has, you know, there's only places, special places where you can buy alcohol. You can't buy them usually at grocery stores and things like that. Um, and you have to have some kind of a license to be able to sell alcohol. Um, and so, um, so of course, liquor, and there was this constant put a back and forth about trying to reduce the ills of alcoholism and try and reduce the amount of people who are drinking alcohol or who are engaged in very public kind of intoxication. And so in 1838, when the police department is formed, and it was the first police department in the United States, um, urban police department that was kind of organized as a police department, um, there was a lot of this stuff about alcohol. There was also other types of vice enforcement, gaming, prostitution, um, this quote unquote disorderly, disorderly houses. Um, and then the police progressively as the 1800s went along, they assumed the role of maintaining order. And in kind of a sort of a chilling way, um, in a way it's sort of a precursor to modern times. Um, the, in, in, in 1850, there was increased Irish immigration there was also riots that occurred in the 1830s. These are all kind of helped to form and kind of strengthen the, the need for a police department. But one of the biggest things that's sort of the focus of our talk is the Boston Police Department, even for an area in which um, slavery did not occur, did not exist under state law, uh, the Boston Police Department was still responsible for picking up and um, sometimes expatriating uh, fugitive slaves from the South who had come in there, despite a lot of controversy and a lot of pushback from the community, they were still involved in trying to um, capture fugitive slaves from the South. Okay, so, um, so of course, 1838 is the Boston Police Department, 1844 is the New York City Police Department. And what happens with this story of policing, though, is, is that it focuses, it's focused predominantly on the North predominantly on cities. And so, as many of you know, the United States is a very diverse um, country. And even in the time of the colonial period, it was a very diverse um, country. And, and, and as I said earlier, the biggest divide in the colonial period and throughout uh, leading up to the Civil War was between North and South and between slavery and uh, slaveholding states and non-slaveholding states. And so what's going on in the South? What is going on in a largely rural plantation economy with a large number of enslaved people. I and mean, if we look back at the prior analysis about the need for police departments, you would have public riots, public intoxication, but really the fourth one, the need to control the dangerous classes. And of course, what we have is, is that you have slave patrols in the South. And these are really, they don't function in the same way as modern police but they are really what were kind of precursors to modern police. And this uh, painting, um, this engraving from 1863 kind of shows a little bit about how the um, slave patrols worked. They worked at night. They kind of went around to enforce these curfews. They wanted to make sure that if there were any enslaved people or out and about, they had to have a pass to make sure they were able to leave their master's plantation. Um, and then they would be checked. Um, they could, the slave patrols could then um, engage in all kinds of searches. They would, they, would, they would follow religious meetings of enslaved uh, populations to make sure there wasn't any kind of like insurrection. Um, there was a lot of this kind of um, going into homes 
and uh, you know going into meetings, and that they were, and and that's how this kind of came about um, in the 1800s. But once more, the way that it started in the beginning with these slave patrols, though, was that well, every southern state had them, but um, it it, it kind of turned out that. Um, when you had these less formal ways of dealing with enslaved populations, because for a while it was just viewed as the responsibility of the plantation owner, um, but then that quickly became inadequate. And in the Caribbean, especially um, in the West Indies, uh, there was a lot of rules about how to control enslaved populations. And so there was, um, sometimes it would be the militia. There was like, the, as I mentioned before, um, and sometimes it was just sort of independent contractors, basically, that would go around and there would be slave catchers. But none of these systems really worked that well to control um, and to control really the anxiety of a lot of the Southern white populations towards enslaved populations. And so by the time of the 1800s, every Southern state had these slave patrols and they functioned like this. They worked at night. They were usually relegated to a particular district um, and that, um, and it's because like, you know, these other informal mechanisms were not, um, they were not, uh, they, 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 they didn't seem to do, they didn't, they didn't form, they didn't provide the proper level of control for these, um, slave, um, enslaved populations. Um, and so basically over a period of time, rules and law were established around them. And some of the, one of the first places that had this was South Carolina. And they borrowed a lot of this from uh, the Barbados and which had its, um, a significant amount of um, slave, um, slave holding as well as like slave uh, populations that were there um, that, that, that kind of enabled a body of law to develop around it um, as well as slave patrols. Um, to come up. Okay, so, um, and in fact, actually the uh, slave patrols, I mean, these were pretty significant forces because they had about a hundred slave patrols, even in these, in these cities of the South, the South wasn't devoid of cities. And so you still had cities like in places like Charleston, South Carolina. And in fact, you had a lot of, you had freed, freed blacks as well in the South. And so these, patrols, they would not only keep tabs on enslaved populations, they would also keep tabs on free black populations in um, cities, especially places like Charleston. And so a lot of scholars kind of viewed this 100 police officers as the most sophisticated and first police force in the United States. And a lot of what their reason though for being was about controlling the black population. Okay, and I think what is kind of very interesting and kind of very chilling about these slave patrols is, is that um, they oftentimes use the vocabulary of the law. This is sort of a very unique kind of American um, intervention, right? Um, in the sense that you would have, um, that you would have these um, things like uh, patrols and stuff always kind of gathered up in a very kind of kind of legalistic language. And so what you have is you have a court like the um, like the uh, the court in Arkansas that would talk about the patrol system is a police regulation for the several townships in a county, which being kept alive in the statute book is a slumbering power ready to be aroused and called into action. And that's kind of how the Supreme Court of Arkansas described the patrols. And the patrols, what they did was, is that they would, like a modern police force, they would be relegated to a specific district. They weren't allowed to sort of roam around from one district to another, just like modern police forces in the sense that you have police departments that are really relegated to certain towns, at least in the United States. They don't you know, generally go, for example, we live in a place in Pennsylvania called State College. The State College Police Department doesn't go to the neighboring town of Belfont. They have a Belfont Police Department. And, um, and so uh, that kind of geographic kind of determination 
is not a result of slave patrols, but that's how slave patrols did function in the South, which is that they were limited by the townships in a particular county, okay? Um, but it's not just the vocabulary of law enforcement, right? There was also other, you know, they, there was this term called the beat. And you might, I don't, you may have recognized this, there's sort of popularized in a lot of like uh, television dramas like Law and Order and things like that, where police officers will talk about their beat. Well, that term itself actually was, it predates slave patrols, but it was certainly used during um, slave patrols where they would describe the places where they were actually patrolling. They would, it would be described in fact as a beat, okay? Then you actually even had something called like a stakeout where sometimes the patrols didn't move around. They would actually stay in one place and they would, they would kind of, um, they, would, they would sort of do investigations and see if people were breaking the rules on, on, um, on selling to slaves. This actually was a, was a pretty common problem in the South, which is that um, slaves would buy, you know, different types of goods from other, from, 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 from white people living in the South. And so that was considered to be, that was illegal. And so it occurred all the time, this kind of illegal trade. And um, the police would be there to sort of stake out uh, these things. Um, okay, so um, let me actually, let's go back one. Um, so, so in fact, actually, and I, and I should sort of point out that it, the way in which the slave patrols came up, they were, the legislature oftentimes had a bunch of rules about them, but the way in which they were appointed and constituted really changed from place to place. And in some places like North Carolina, it was actually the courts that appointed it, that said, okay, you, Mr. Smith, you, uh, Mr. Jones, you all are going to be on the slave patrol. And sometimes they were paid. Sometimes they had other types of exemptions from militia duty, things like that. Um, and the, the, uh, the work of the slave patrols, I would say like as we get into uh, entering into the Civil War era, um, it's uh, and entering into and getting near the Civil War, which is around the 1860s, they became much more kind of like you know, worried and concerned about slave insurrections. There was a lot more kind of agitation about abolitionism. And there was a whole set of, um, a lot of, um, I mean, whatever kind of partisanship is the United States is going in right now, probably is um, nothing compared to what was going on in the 1800s in terms of the fights over abolition and the kinds of um, uh, rhetoric and kind of violence that accompanied some of the ways um, uh, of controlling um, enslaved populations in the United States. And the slave patrols certainly were a part of this kind of increasing paranoia as we get into the Civil War era. Okay, so of course, the Civil War occurs 1861 to 1865. Abraham Lincoln declares the Emancipation Proclamation. And so, you know, the slave patrols are kind of done, right? Um, or are they? You know, that's kind of the, uh, like what happens after the, um, the, the uh, Civil War. So when the Civil War occurs in 1865, um, the, um, the, uh, the, and the, sur the South surrenders, there's a bunch of Union troops that don't leave the South. They stay there until 1877. And from that period of time between 18, 1865 and 1877, that's called reconstruction in uh, US history. And in that period of time, um, these slave patrols, obviously they don't exist anymore in this particular kind of way. But basically what Southern legislatures did was they changed the laws so that slavery existed in all but name. They had a series, they passed a series of laws, Southern legislatures called black codes, where basically, um, there were like laws requiring, requiring you to be employed. And if you were not employed, then you were put into jail. And then there would be some kind of a white landowner that would then buy your freedom 
And then you would work off your freedom by basically being a slave on a plantation. And so not much really changed for a lot of people after the Civil War ended. Um, of course, what ended up happening is that the Union Army was still there. And they forced these state legislatures to get rid of all of these black codes. And these black codes were very, very intrusive, right? I mean, they would be like being disrespectful to, to a white person that was a criminal violation and so on and so forth. Um, but, you know, those things kind of went away because it was still reconstruction. And then of course, um, you know, we'll, we'll sort of see um, that um, you have after that though, you have kind of extra legal kind of avenues, the KKK that come up in the South that end up uh, forming a lot of terror in this. Um, so the way in which policing, I mean, I think it's important to sort of think about what the historical archive is. I mean, how do we, how do we get some of the information um, about to reconstruct views of patrols and police and things like that? And one of the ways in which um, this occurred was during the Great Depression, there was a there was a project um, under the it was it was called the uh, the works the works project administration WPA and they had something called the federal writers project and what these folks did was that they went around and they actually spoke to enslaved people formerly enslaved people in the 1930s so these were people who were maybe kids maybe they were in their 80s and um, this picture is of Mr. Bost. He was 88 years old, around 1936 to 1938 in North Carolina. And basically they would go around and they would interview these folks. And this is like a wealth of information. And in fact, it's kind of incredible because all of these kind of slave narratives are there online. If you go up into the Library of Congress, there's like a million pages of testimony from um, enslaved people from the 1930s talking about their memories of what is going on um, in their experiences as slaves. And it's a really incredible sort of repository of information that the federal government kind of, kind of um, it formed a, in the 1930s as a result of the Great Depression and trying to, try to give people employment um, um, as a result of that. So this is a quote from Mr. Bost, which is that then the paddy rollers, the patrols, they keep close watch. They have no chance to do anything or they're talking about slaves or go anywhere. They're just like police, only worser. And so the reason for why I wanted to sort of mention this is not only because of how um, the way in which a lot of this information is derived from, but it's also that in a lot of, for a lot of people who lived through slavery, through reconstruction, through the latter half of the 19th century, um, when the KKK became ascendant and through when the KKK kind of was still there, but the police kind of took over, there was really very little distinction. Whether you were a slave patroller, Ku Klux Klan, or the police, there was very, very little differentiation among a lot of um, formerly enslaved um, people. So something to keep in mind. Um, and so, of course, this is the sign of the KKK, the blood drop cross. And this is a hate symbol. Um, and the reason for why I've, well, this is kind of like, um, and in fact, actually, in some ways, the KKK was worse. This is Booker T. Washington, a really famous, um, famous African-American um, scholar um, who was, a, you know, living in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And it actually says the Ku Klux Klan were like the patrollers. They operated almost wholly at night. They were, however, more cruel than the patrollers. It's kind of an odd irony that the Ku Klux Klan, as an extra legal force, right? They had to wear sheets. They were, you know, they had to conceal their identity. The patrollers could go out. But what happened was that the patrollers oftentimes didn't sort of, they didn't sort of harm slaves or kill slaves in the same way um, that the Ku Klux Klan harmed and killed African Americans in the South. And the reason for that partially, um, well, reason for that is because the slaves were still considered property, right? And so if there was harm to that property, the slave owners oftentimes would get very upset about it. And so you actually, in fact, have a not uncommon situation where you have uh, court cases that come up where um, slave owners are 
litigating um, the rights or the you know damage to their property as a result of the actions of patrollers. And so, in fact, you have tort actions that occurred in the antebellum South involving uh, patrollers, whether they were liable for the damage that they inflicted on slaves. The KKK didn't have any of those restrictions. They were there simply to uh, maintain a kind of racial order in the South. And so they were, um, you know, but they were, and I mean, among a lot of white Southerners though, the KKK kind of represented the real law and order. And they had a lot, a great deal of support among, um, among white people in the South during the early part of the 20th century. And this blood red cross is a symbol of the KKK. And this has of course made, you know, this is something that, um, that this symbol has been found in a lot of different areas even now. Um, and that's one of the concerns why I wanted to, to bring up this, uh, this hate symbol from that the Anti-Defamation League has on their website. Um, but the KKK is, is not dead in the United States, even though it's, it's not, it doesn't have the same kind of reach as it did in the early part of the 20th century. It is not dead. Okay. So you have slave patrols, you have some uh, reconstruction, and then you have the KKK. And then of course you have, um, as this is all going on, you have the civil rights era. And so this is the famous picture in Birmingham. And um, what's kind of important is, is that um, as we're talking about the Birmingham, the foot soldier of Birmingham, um, I think that's the name of this photo, um, that the police oftentimes were involved in um, kind of turning a blind eye. And you kind of see this, this also theme is there in modern policing as well, is, is that um, they would turn a blind eye towards the actions of the KKK. And so in that part, the criminal law or the uh, laws are not enforced at all. But then when it came down to other areas, you know, the law would be completely and rigorously enforced. And in fact, actually, the head of the police department in Birmingham, um, in fact, ordered the uh, police officers to go and, and basically make life very difficult for civil rights activists in the um, in the uh, in in Birmingham during um, the the civil rights movement. Okay, so um, so that's what's occurring, and of course, you know, it's hard to not see the continuities. And what about today? This is the George Floyd Memorial, New York Times, um, and um, and you kind of see some of these um, resonances with uh, modern day policing. Now, I want to be clear. The modern day police in the United States, they're not functioning like slave patrols and they're not functioning like the extra legal kind of authorities like the KKK. Um, they're not going around burning people's homes and doing all of that. But you know, it, 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 when you have this history where all of this stuff has occurred and for someone like Mr. Bost, the 1930s to say that, I don't really see any difference between slave patrols police, KKK, they all are basically the same. Um, it's kind of, it makes it much more understandable why there are people who are calling for just getting rid of the police. And maybe if it was just history that occurred and there was no violence, maybe we can try and, you know, the United States can move past this history of policing. But this is sort of an ongoing problem right now in police departments. Um, so you have, you know, obviously some of the most highly publicized instances of violence against um, African Americans um, with George Floyd and other and other people, Breonna Taylor. The list kind of goes on and on. But you also have a number of really bad scandals that that occur, and in fact, they're kind of called ghost skins which is that a lot of, and this is a very modern, you know, 20th, 21st century uh, phenomenon that it still has echoes of the past, which is that you have white nationalists that infiltrate local law enforcement. And that's, they were called ghost skins, right? And the FBI reported that white supremacists posed a persistent threat of lethal violence and white supremacist and anti-government militias, militia groups have active links to law enforcement. Okay, it's from the Brandon Center. Then you also have, um, you've had a, over 100 police departments that face scandals over racist texts, emails, or published 
or public social media posts. And that's just the ones that have kind of come to the surface, right? There's a lot of, lot of issues even now. Um, and then you have like the way in with the law enforcement kind of, um, this is what a lot of people have pointed out to is the way in which the Black Lives Matter, that's what BLM stands for, the Black Lives Matter protests in the United States, how they've been handled by law enforcement versus say the January 6th, 6th insurrection at the Capitol, right? And a lot of times you find that these far right militia groups, when they protest, law enforcement has a very different relationship. There's much less kind of police initiated violence against um, those protesters versus Black Lives Matter protesters. And in fact, actually, one white nationalist who was there, who was an ex-neo-Nazi um, from Philadelphia, actually, um, he would, was trying to recruit law enforcement. And, um, and a lot of the police officers he spoke to would say something like this. I understand where you're coming from. I listened to Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh was a uh, very prominent um, right-wing talk show radio host. He did pass away um, recently. And so, so really, um, that's the end of my presentation. But, um, you know, the, the point of this um, for, for, for me, at least, coming from my own uh, journey, I guess, um, as a result of being a public defender and now a local government official, is that these links to the history are really very compelling. Um, it's very different too, um, but it's like, what do we, how do we deal with this going forward? And how do we overcome it as a society in the United States when you have this history and you still have some of the continuities of that history occurring today? Thank you so much um, for, for presenting, um, for allowing me to present and I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, uh, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor. Uh, it was indeed a, a very enlightening uh, session. And uh, I have uh, received a few questions. So uh, we'll start with the first question from our uh, student. Uh, and she's asking uh, that, is there a reason why the Navy, even though a part of the Federal Armed Forces, is not bound by the Posse Comitatus Act? Well, I mean, the Posse Comitatus Act, I should say, it's a little bit different, which is that the armed forces are not involved in policing. Um, and it actually, it occurred post-Civil War. Um, in fact, the Posse Comitatus Act. It's a good question. Um, the, I mean, to my understanding, the Navy is, is just like other parts of the armed forces. They are not, they're not allowed to be involved in policing. So I think my understanding is the Navy is still... Um, is still, uh, it, it still has the same limitations on other parts of the armed forces. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, there's another question, uh, uh, which is, uh, I'll, I'll just read it out. And uh, uh, we have seen that, uh, you know, uh, in certain states, the police personnel are elected. And then there are certain uh, states where uh, they are appointed. So how do you see this in the context of race? And can, uh, you know, can we say that one of the method is the preferred one over the other? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I can tell you that most of the places where I've lived, the police chief, this is one of the complexities of the United States is, is that there are a million local governments and police, policing is ultimately a function of local governments. That's the, the main, main avenue in which people encounter the police. And so the way that they do that, it's going to change from place to place. In some places, the police chiefs might be elected. Some places, um, they are appointed. I mean, in state college, the way that it works is, is that the borough council, the kind of the legislative body of which I'm a part of, will appoint someone called a manager. And that manager then appoints who the police chief is. Um, and, you know, it's, 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 it's really hard to say which one works better. Um, in terms of like uh, police chiefs, I'm much more familiar with this appointed model rather than one in which uh, people are elected. Um, I think that's a great question, but um, unfortunately I don't really have a, a clear answer on that one way or the other. Okay, so we have another question uh, by uh, 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 Dia Shekhawat, and she's asking that uh, by looking deeply at the history of racism in policing, uh, 
we can better understand why it's uh, not just reform, but a full transformation that is necessary for us to end violence and injustice. We have known the problem and we have known the solution for 100 years. Why do you think it still persists? Is it the bad implementation? Well, that's a that's a great question too, and I think here here I could provide a I could provide some answer, which is that I think for a large extent in the last one hundred years, it wasn't only until recently that these issues have really come to the forefront. Um, a lot of the stuff that people spoke about when it came down to policing, it was a very kind of it was it, it's it's a problem with all minority communities, right? I mean, you're never going to win elections. Uh, the majority of uh, white Americans in the United States, they still, if you look at surveys, they don't have any problems with policing. Um, it's changed a lot. And that number has changed significantly. And I think that's really where the impetus for change has come about. If you look at surveys, say 30 years ago, um, the percentage of the percentage of African Americans, it, it may be sort of similar dissatisfactions with the police as there are today. But with, it's really with white Americans whose attitudes have changed significantly that I think um, in a way have kind of given enough uh, electoral weight to be able to change the, uh, change the system. I think that's one thing where, you know, when we're, we're kind of dealing with a very new phenomenon right now in the United States. That's point number one. Um, I can tell you that with the Black Lives Matter movement and the protests that surrounded it, that was unlike anything that had been seen in the United States involving criminal justice reform. And so there's a lot more calls for this now that are from all parts of the political spectrum. And so I think the chances for reform now are much higher. Um, I do think though that um, while the abolishing police department, you can certainly understand it given this history and getting rid of it, um, and defunding the police, I, I don't think that that is, that's probably not the way reform will occur. And I'll give you one example that in Minnesota, the place where George Floyd was, uh, was murdered, um, they had a vote um, to get rid of their police department in Minneapolis and come up with something called a Department of Public Safety, which would have policing functions, but would sort of not be called the police, you know? Um, and that was voted down by the voters in Minneapolis. And in fact, the majority of black voters, in fact, uh, voted that down. And I think what that, what that story tells you is, is that this is, there are no monoliths, right? Um, there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of um, you know, African-Americans that support the police. They just want to support other things too. They want a certain, they want more policing in certain types of areas and they want less policing in other types of areas. And so I think that is, that's probably going to be the discussion moving forward is how do we how do we not have a reflexive kind of a reaction to it but I think calls to abolish I think that's probably going to be less likely okay uh, thank you for uh, the answer uh, another very interesting question uh, which we have here is that why and how written house trial weakens the police reform argument when black life uh, matter movement is on the rise at this time Oh, interesting. Like, how does the uh, written house, um, you know, um, I will have to say, you know, I mean, the written house trial, it was, it was kind of weird because, um, you know, the written house trial from a, from a legal perspective, right? Um, and as a criminal defense attorney, I mean, when I look at the written house trial, I can see why it was a self-defense argument there. Um, I mean, there was, there was a lot of um, a lot of you know um, um, aspects of that case that made it a pretty good self defense case from a legal perspective. I think the actual impact. This is just my opinion. Um, I think the impact of the Rittenhouse trial actually got weakened in the United States because you had the Ahmad Arbery trial that occurred in Georgia just like the following week or something, and the verdict there was guilty for those um, two white individuals who had gunned down Ahmad Arbery. And so I think that in that sense, the impact of the Rittenhouse trial became somewhat weakened as a result of what happened in the Ahmad Arbery verdict. And Ahmad Arbery, this was the, the case where um, this, uh, this young black man 
was uh, jogging in Georgia. And these two, uh, you know, white, the three actually white individuals had come up and basically shot him in cold blood. And there was a uh, trial about that. And then they were found, they were convicted of first degree murder. So, um, you know, in terms of that, I mean, you know, I, I see the Rittenhouse case as more about vigilantism and about like the links between some of these white nationals groups and what the actual uh, links were between Rittenhouse and some of the law enforcement. Um, and I think in that sense, it's, it's relevant, but I think in fact, actually, I'm not sure it had too much of an impact on calls for reform. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, so uh, a question from my side, and uh, I think uh, we'll be uh, taking up uh, this question only if the time permits. So uh, when we talk about as a legal professional, so I mean, what can be done? I mean, uh, I'm talking in the uh, comparative context as well. We, India also, in India also, we feel that, uh, you know, there are certain biases in policing. And sometimes the, there are prejudices uh, in law enforcement. So as legal uh, professionals, what is there that we can contribute, uh, you know, when we talk about eliminating those prejudices or biases? Right. No, great question. Um, and, you know, I think that um, a part of it is, is that part of the reason for why I mentioned um, this, um, my background and my professional background as a criminal defense attorney is, is that this whole history behind policing was completely news to me. And as even someone who was within this field and kind of deeply involved in it, and deeply involved in some form or another in calls for reform of police, I just didn't know anything about it. So I think in part, um, I think education and education in terms of understanding how um, people are, um, people are um, certain groups might view the police from this historical lens. So I think that's one part of it that we can, we can play a very important role. I think the other part about this is, is that, um, you know, as, um, as lawyers is that um, we, we are sort of in a unique position to, to um, be able to talk to different constituencies, to not just even talk to the police about like say constitutional standards and why they're important, but also to the public and to present it into the kind of political sphere. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's had a really important role in the reformation of some of these police departments and in terms of training, um, in terms of how use of force and things like that, they've really had a, 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 a big impact. So I think that through education and through engagement in the political system and lawyers are very um, well equipped to do that. I think that's where we can really make some headway. Thank you, sir. Uh, so I wanted to wind up the thing, but we have a very interesting question uh, from our sociology professor, uh, Dr. Oh, sure. Rebhuta. So he says that, uh, can you share your views on racial profiling uh, in policy? Oh, well, oh yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm totally happy to share that. Yeah, no, it's, um, well, you know, obviously the numbers are not, are not very good. Um, there is a ton of racial profiling that occurs. Um, and part of the problem that we have from the legal perspective is getting access to information. Um, if we ever wanna make some of these claims in court, oftentimes what we end up finding that's more, most difficult is finding access to police databases and information about it. So that's, that's a, it's something that's a very, very common problem. I will say this though, my personal problem, um, I've been stopped by the police while driving in the United States about six or seven times. And I used to drive this kind of older Honda Civic stick shift, you know, and uh, I would get, I got stopped by the police for not using a turn signal for this and that. Um, I will say that, you know, in the past five years, I've never gotten stopped by the police um, in Pennsylvania. And I don't know if part of that is better training. Um, it may also be that now, you know, as a, as a middle-aged guy with uh, two kids, I have a minivan that I drive everywhere now and that I shuttle the kids. It's like the car of all middle-aged parents, right? Um, and I just, you know, I, I just haven't gotten stopped um, and I drive the same. So I wanna leave with that anecdote to know that, you know, that the problem with race and policing and with profiling is definitely there, but the story is probably much more complicated than just a one-to-one -one 
ratio on uh, race and getting stopped. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you. There are uh, many questions coming up, pouring in, uh, but uh, we'll have to stick to our timings also. So yeah. uh, we'll take a pause here. And uh, now it's time to say thanks to you. And uh, uh, I'm very certain that your lecture on the topic uh, of such relevance and magnitude has proved an eye opener for all of us. And uh, it will definitely motivate us to think, read, and research about the same uh, uh, from the comparative perspectives as well. Uh, I formally say a thank you to you uh, on behalf of Institute of Law, Nirma University. Uh, thank you very much. Ma'am, if you have to say something to us. Yeah, uh, thank you, Neeraj. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor, for sparing time and uh, delivering a talk. And we look forward to, you, uh, to invite you in the campus uh, when the situation uh, will improve. And uh, there are so, uh, so many of my faculty colleagues who are interested in this topic. So if we can have a collaborative research also, we can go ahead. So okay. some, of you, some of my faculty may approach you. I'll be sharing your details with uh, them. So we we'll look forward for a long uh, association with you. Thank, Thank you, so you so much. much. Thank you okay. so much. Uh, I'm honored Thank to so be here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank Thank you. Take care. <laughs> Thank you, sir. And thank you, everyone, for uh, yeah, attending the uh, event. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care.